Today, we are going to see how God can use even wicked political leaders. Because God's that big, he can rule through even people like that. Then we're gonna ask this question, have you ever accidentally lost your child somewhere? Because Mary and Joseph did. Join us today as we continue in Luke and talk about those two things. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Luke series. Glad you are joining us. We ended our last session with uh, Mary and Joseph back in Nazareth. We'll pick it up in Luke chapter 2, verse 39. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. The child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and in the grace, the grace of God was upon him. Now, what's interesting is that that's, it just goes from, you know, his birth then to, to Nazareth. But Luke doesn't tell us the whole story. But it's interesting because the gospel, Matthew's gospel, he actually expounds on what happened after Jesus was born and before they actually went back to Nazareth. And um, what we need to understand is that uh, Mary Joseph's life wasn't very easy. And I wanted to fill in this timeline so you could see how difficult it really was. Uh, it wasn't like they just, you know, had the baby, went back to Nazareth and just lived life. There was a lot going on with Jesus that had something to do with the political leaders of the time. And uh, Matthew tells us about it. So we're going to go to Matthew and we're going to kind of fill in the blanks here. But the reason why Matthew talks about this in greater detail is because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. Luke is writing to a Gentile audience like you and I. So he's not going to worry so much about details. Matthew is. Because Matthew's heart is to, to show the Jewish people that Jesus is the promised Messiah. This was his heart. This is his goal for, his, for the gospel that he wrote, the gospel that we know as Matthew. Uh, because he, he knows that if he can go back and say, look, Jesus' birth, I'm going to show you in the Old Testament where that was prophesied. Now, I always say for me that whenever I start doubting my faith, fulfilled prophecy brings me right back to a faith that's even stronger. Because I always say any book that tells me over 2,000 times something that will happen and then actually does to the letter, we probably need to pay attention to what the author of that book, which is God himself, has to say. Since he knows the future, what he says is going to happen in the future, we can be assured that it actually will, which is why we do a lot of end times things, because we want you to see that, that the prophecies about end times are going to come true. It's, God's got a pretty good track record. So let's fill in what we can from Matthew. Seems like Mary and Joseph, had, you know, the baby was born in Bethlehem. They must have been in Bethlehem. They, you know, at one point went to Jerusalem, you know, for a little while. In Bethlehem, it seems like the wise men showed up there with their gifts uh, and then they leave. But what Matthew tells us is that Mary and Joseph actually didn't go straight to Nazareth. Matthew 2.13 says this. Now when they had gone, the, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Herod wants to kill Jesus because he hears that this king was born in, in, you know, in Bethlehem and, and he's frustrated, you know, being Herod being as cuckoo crazy as he is. And so he wants to kill all the, the little babies. So all of this is going on. So the, an angel tells Joseph, get Mary and Jesus to Egypt. Egypt, that's a long way away. But, um, but he did it. Look at verse 14. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Now, I love this about Joseph. It's like God says it, he does it. That's, that's a difficult journey with a brand new baby and, and his, his young wife who just had like a baby. Now, they also, along with that, they were young. They were poor. And, and, and now God's saying, I need you to get to Egypt. Well, that's going to be a journey. But it's like we talked about in our last week's lesson. Life is difficult. Life is like a waiting game. God never, ever promised us that life was going to go smooth all the time. But I love Mary and Joseph. They just served God and obeyed him, whether it was easy or not. 
And I think that's one of the lessons we can learn from this. Look at verse 15. He remained there, so they're in Egypt now, until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill, now this is where Matthew comes in and says, hey, Jewish people, this is going to fulfill an Old Testament scripture. This will fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So, so Matthew's saying, look at your Old Testament scriptures. It's there. And now you see that Jesus had gone to Egypt. Um, the wise men had been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So that's why Herod was all freaking out. Uh, verse 16, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children. So he goes and kills all the children who were in Bethlehem, all, in, all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So Herod's just on a murderous, crazy rampage because he wants to kill any baby under two years because he knows, he assumes that that's where Jesus is and he wants him gone. He wants him gone off this earth. Um, verse 17, another prophecy that, that Matthew is trying to explain. He said, then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And then he, he, he reiterates this particular verse in Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So he's saying this verse back in the Old Testament that, that was prophesied is being fulfilled when Herod went to kill all the babies. Verse 19, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. So he stays there until Herod dies. So Joseph gets up, took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Don't know exactly how long they stayed. Not exactly sure how many years this is. Maybe it was only a year long enough for there to be a change in the government after the death of Herod. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, so Herod's son, Archelaus, is now going to reign, he was afraid. He was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So Matthew just filled in a bunch of blanks for us. And in the process, he's trying to explain to Jewish people that you need to understand that what's happening with Jesus is a fulfillment of your scriptures. You've got to believe in him. This was, this was Matthew's heart. Now, let's go to, back to Luke. After Jesus' birth, um, Luke, like I said, doesn't record all that happens, but they do end up back in Nazareth, which is one more reason why we can look at the rise and fall of leaders in the world. Because God used Herod for such a time as this, for such a time as this, for Jesus to come on the scene and to be born and to go to Egypt and fulfill scripture. Like, like God had a purpose for Herod during the birth of Jesus. And I just want, because we're in a, this is 2024. So we are in an election year. Yay. And we need to be reminded of this exact thing. Because I always say that we're on this one way track to when Jesus comes back. And God says in the book of Daniel that God is the one who raises up leaders and presidents, just like he did with Herod for such a time as this. And I always say that, that, that Herod was raised up for such a time as the birth of Jesus. And God is raising up leaders all over this world to bring about the return of Jesus. And I don't know how that plays out with our elections. I, I have no idea what God is doing and I don't worry about it. I say God raises, God deposes, I'm not going to worry because I know that there's a purpose behind the leaders that he allows to be in our government. I always have to tell you my really horrible politician joke because I have very few politician jokes that I can use, but now that it's a political year, I can. Uh, there was a busload of politicians. They were driving down a, a county, uh, county road, arguing with each other over politics. All of a sudden, the bus runs off the road, crashed into a tree in an old farmer's field. The old farmer, after seeing what happened, went over to investigate. He proceeds to dig a hole and just buries all the politicians. A few days later, the local sheriff came out, saw the crashed bus and said, where did all the politicians go? And he goes, well, I buried them. And the sheriff said, well, the coroner wasn't here. Are you sure they were all dead? <laughs> he goes, the old farmer says, well, some of them said that they weren't, but you know how them there politicians lie all the time. <laughs> why that makes me laugh. Welcome to the 2024 election year. All right, let's pick up the story back up with Jesus living in Nazareth, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. 
Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast, um, at the feast of the Passover. So now it's fat Passover time. Uh, from Nazareth, the families are traveling in a caravan, which they probably did that to prevent like robberies along the way. This was a fun time. It was a family time. It was like a big family get together. People from all over different towns converge in Jerusalem. Verse 42, and when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Now, that made me think of a time when we lost our little son, Sean. We were in California and he was probably about five. We were all walking together. He turned to the right to go to the video machines. We didn't see him do that. We just kept going. And when we got outside of the hotel and we all started you know, counting numbers, we realized, where's Sean? He's missing. And so I know that panic feeling that, that, that wh where did he go? Like what just happened to him? And I can't imagine how Mary and Joseph must have felt for three days, not knowing where their son was. Apparently I'm the worst mom because I also left our son Micah at a movie theater when he was also about five. Uh, I thought everyone was in the car. The boys always sat in the very back seat and they were all joking around. They always joked around a lot. And so they're like, hey mom, you forgot Micah. Well, I thought Micah was just like down so that I couldn't see him, but it was kind of a joke. And so I just started pulling away out of the parking lot and they're like, no, 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 mom, serious. Like you really forgot Mike. <laughs> I had to go back into the theater and poor Mike is standing there with tears. Like how did everyone just leave me? So yay for me being a really good mother. But anyway, thankfully now they have cell phones for five-year-olds. So uh, that probably doesn't happen as much anymore. Verse 46, then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. Imagine, Jesus wasn't missing his parents or his cousins or anyone. He was living his best life in the temple, listening to the very word of God. Verse 47, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So let's talk about the temple really quick. As you go through uh, Luke, you can kind of see it whenever we talk about it here. The temple became the focus of the lives of the Jewish people. Here is a picture of what it looks like. There's a big model in Jerusalem. So if you ever go there, you can kind of see this is a replica of what they think it looked like back in the days of Jesus. So it was this massive Herod's temple. It was white. It was big. It was beautiful. But the temple became an idol to the Jewish people. Um, th there was rituals and sacrifices, and it was the clothes they wore and the loudest prayers and, and who can be the highest priest. But that was never what God meant for the temple. Originally, the tabernacle that Moses, you know, had, had built out in the wilderness, it was, it was a place. It was a place to, to meet with God, to get to know him, to pray to him. And, but what, what, once it, the temple was built in, um, in Jerusalem, what it produced was just religion, religion based on works and who can keep the most laws. And it became very, very works based. But now Jesus is on the scene. And, and what, we, what God is trying to do is shift away from the temple as a place of religion and insert Jesus, who, who is considered like the temple. Verse uh, John 2.19 says this, Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I rise it up. He's saying, my body is the temple, and, and I will ri rise up from the dead. Everything in the Old Testament, and the Jews should have known this because they knew their scriptures, foreshadowed Jesus foreshadowed his coming to this earth. Think of Adam and Eve all the way back in Genesis. They sinned. God had to, you know, kill an animal to, to sacrifice an animal, to get the skins off the animal, to cover Adam and Eve. And uh, so that just foreshadows what Jesus would do when he would, you know, have to die as a sacrifice to cover our sins. Think about Noah. Noah builds an ark. There's one door to get into the ark. Everyone was invited. Hey, come on to the ark. Be saved. Nope. Everyone laughed at Noah. Everyone laughed. The door was shut. Everyone died. That's just, and God's like, that's a foreshadowing of, if you got to come through the one door, which is Jesus alone. How about Isaac? Isaac was the promised son to, to Abraham and Sarah, but Sarah was 90. She was barren. She couldn't have any children. It would take a miracle for Isaac to be born. 
And that's exactly what happened. Then we look at Mary. Mary was a virgin. She's not going to get pregnant unless something happens miraculously. And um, then we look at when God told Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Isaac had to carry the wood. Jesus had to carry his own cross. So what you can see is there's, there's all this Old Testament foreshadowing of what Jesus would, would fulfill. And this is, you know, this is what especially Matthew wanted them to really understand, the Jewish people to understand. But for us, we need to look back to the Old Testament and see Jesus as the, the ultimate fulfillment of foreshadowing and, and, and um, prophecies, all of those kind of things. Now, let's look at really quick what the function of the temple was back then. It was a place, first of all, of God's presence. Um, this was where, like in the tabernacle, remember when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 days, God would show up in the tabernacle, like his presence would be there. And so this is what the temple was meant to be. That was one of the functions of the temple was God's presence. Um, this temple, the one that Jesus was in, was actually destroyed in 70 AD. And the greatest part of it being destroyed was because God wanted to make a point. I don't dwell there anymore. I don't dwell in the temple anymore. Now you have to come to me through my son. My, my presence is in my son, Jesus. Uh, the second reason why the temple existed was so people could make sacrifices. We saw that with Mary and Joseph a couple weeks ago. They had to you know, bring a lamb or a bird or something to kill. The, the blood would cover their sins. And now Jesus' blood would cover sins. So no, no more need for the temple. The last reason was that it was a place for worship. People came there saying, prayed, fellowshiped with others. It was kind of like being at camp with all your friends. Um, but all of that had to stop because now when Jesus came, like worshipers don't have to go to a specific place. People all over the world, China, you know, Japan, you know, Australia, everyone can worship God in spirit now and truth. You don't need an actual place to go to. Okay, so let's pick it up in Luke 21 verse 5. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. That's Luke 21. That's just saying, he's saying, look, y'all think the temple's the greatest place ever, but I want you to see that it's all coming down. It's all coming down. And this was God's way of saying, none of it's going to be there anymore because now Jesus replaces that temple. All right, let's go all the way back to Luke chapter 2, where we are, and um, verse 48. When they saw him, they were astonished. They see Jesus in the temple at 12 years old. They're astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Like, did, you, did it not occur to you that your mom and dad would be terrified when we realized, like, you're not in the caravan with everyone? I would have probably been furious. But Jesus' response is amazing. Verse 49 said this, and he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Like, what's the big deal? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? At 12 years old, he's telling this to his mother, Mary. And it's almost like all through Jesus's life, there's these moments that Mary needs to be reminded who Jesus was. Like, think about it. It, it, it began with this miraculous conception the angel Gabriel showing up, you're going to be, you know, you're going to have a, have a baby, but I'm not, I've never been with a man, okay? Well, it's, it'll be miraculous. She knows that. So that was the first thing. And then she went to, you know, talk to Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, and that built her faith up. And then, then there were all the angels that at the birth of Jesus with the shepherds, and, and then the angel telling Joseph to go to Egypt. So there, there's along the way, God keeps giving Mary these little moments, these God moments to remind her who Jesus is. Don't get caught up that he's just some kid. He's not. He's the prophesied Messiah. And maybe Mary just needed to hear this from Jesus. The one thing I see with Jesus is that he understands one thing, that he has a mission in this life. And it made me think about my life. And I'm hoping it maybe we'll think, you'll think about this with your life. The question I have to ask is, am I occupied with my father's business more than I'm occupied with my own? Because as a Christian, our goal and our mission in life 
changes when we come to Christ. Before, our life is about me and my happiness. And, and, and now, once you become a Christian, everything changes. And now our life should be about Jesus and people coming to know him. Which is, if, if that's true in our life, then we should ask ourselves, what are we doing? What are we doing with the time that God has given us on this earth? What are we doing with the talents and the gifts that he's given us, the treasures, the money, the possessions? He has given us all of these things so that we can further the gospel. What are we doing with it? But for Mary and Joseph, I thought this was interesting. Verse 50 says this, but they did not understand the statement which he made to them. They were like, what are you talking about? Jesus just told them that, that he was right where he was supposed to be in his father's house. And Mary and Joseph were like, that makes no sense. You are 12 years old. So as we end this lesson, I just want to throw this out as an encouragement to those of you who might be new, new believers, new Christians, because I want you to know that things will be changing in your life and people are not going to understand it, just like they didn't understand Jesus. A lot of people are going to laugh at you for wanting to go to church, laugh at you for not wanting to go to the bars like you used to, laugh at you for not talking nice about, you know, for, for talking nice about people instead of gossiping. They're going to laugh at you when you listen to different music, when you, when you actually, you know, actually do want to go to church and you don't want to stay out late at night because you know next morning is really important. See, people don't understand when Jesus comes into our life that it changes the purpose of our life. And now our lives are about his kingdom, not ours. And they, like Mary and Joseph, were, were, are going to be like you. I don't understand what's gotten into you. Your friends are going to be like, what is wrong with you? I don't understand this. And Mary and Joseph were just like that. Like, I don't understand why you're here. What is this all about? Verse 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So it's like each little step she's reminding. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. My hope and prayer is that we all, as we study the word of God, increase in wisdom and stature in regards to our faith in Jesus. Okay, see you next week. Thank you.